Yo, dude, he's here. He's been writing code help. since before you were born. Get over it. Um, something like that. Uh, and I had to volunteer to introduce someone because I also turned 50 this year. So, okay. you know, 100 years of snarkiness on the stage, whatever. <laughs> I think that was the line we came up with when we realized this. Um, G. Mark's going to talk about that. You, sh you need to remember that, you know, th there are people walking around here who, who just discovered Perl scripts and, you know, are talking like they spent last night with 12 cheerleaders. And, you know, it's like people have been learning new programming languages and technologies for a long time. So you really should listen to people sort of over 20 or 23 or whatever you all are, something like that. <laughs> Go for it, man. Hey, thank you very much. Hey, for anybody who got one of these cards, congratulations. I was handing them out last night. There's 200 of them in circulation. Less than 200 people here, so that tells you how effective the marketing program is. But I did bribe people here, so what I wanted to do is offer some freebies. I'm going to get into my talk in a minute. I'm going to start giving away cool things like T-shirts, uh, NSA swag, some really useful stuff. And it's just because I'm a cool guy and, and the grand prize is going to be really worth your while. So that will keep you from walking out on it if you think that this is worthless. My name is Gmark, Gmark Hardy. I've been doing computer security, hacking, however you want to call it, since 1973 when I first had the opportunity to be introduced to the IBM 360-145 mainframe, when they wheeled in a couple 2741 terminals into our high school, and they said, what are these things? Have we ever remember 2741, or what does that consist of? How about an old Selectric typewriter parked on top of about a 55-pound box of electronic guts? And, you, and what that did is it basically allowed you to communicate. And we had an acoustic coupler. We can go ahead, put the thing in there, 300 baud, wow, we were rocking in the good old days. But anyway, here's a question for you. Okay, I got 200 cards out here. What's a fair way, without a computer, because I'm not doing PowerPoint. We didn't have PowerPoint 30 years ago. You lived or died on your ability to present. So anybody think of a clever way to go ahead and make it a truly random drawing? That's right. No, it's got to be something I got in my own pocket. I figured, okay, what'll work? So I figure, what's, what could be more random? Better than that, because I got to come up with 200 different outcomes and rolling dice. I don't care if you ever did Dungeons and Dragons, trying to get, you know, like the throw of death, like one in 200 is going to take you forever. So I'm going to use dollar bill poker. I'm going to take, yeah, these are just the bills I have in my pocket. Yeah, they're all ones, though, okay? This is like, it's like a high <laughs> clip in reverse. You know, when you get older, you don't want to get rolled, so you put all your ones on the outside. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the last three digits. Of course, if it's an even number, it rolls down to zero, odd number rolls down to one. Anybody have number? Number 96, 0096. All right. Should we do some verification on this? Do you think honor system works pretty well? OK, keep the card. You're in business. As long as they don't call this, pull the same bill again. Oh, by the way, since you were here, you get the dollar bill, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Went to school in Chicago. It was interesting. You know, Mayor Daly, you know, he was. Um, he died in 76, you know, the old one. And it was like a national day of mourning. I mean, the entire city shut down. But a uh, couple more giveaways and then get going? Sure. All right. Number 170. 170, come on down. I give you a cool maybe some NSA swag or nothing. What would you like? You'll have a t-shirt. OK, dollar bill rolled up in there. Right through the camera. OK. Well, I figure if two people don't do it, if I get a collision in terms of the uh, verification process, so everybody's sitting like, OK, I got to sit back. And if nobody raises their hand, I got to wait 15 seconds and go, it's me, it's me. I'm really slow, but it's me. <laughs> Just hold up. Yeah, I don't want to use up my whole hour doing this stuff. So we'll, we'll do some more later. Anyway, what's it like doing hacking back when we didn't have the internet? And you really didn't have email. Thank God we had no cell phones. And the technology was pretty much limited to whatever you get your hands on. Everything was linked in either through acoustic coupler or dedicated lines. And most of your bandwidth was limited to about 300 baud. And yet we found ways to do exploration and poking around in systems that pretty much resemble what we try to do today, just at a faster speed and a larger bandwidth with a greater reach. And so what we had in these were computers they were rigged up, and they had one computer programming language that was available to us. It was an arcane language. It was written by a guy by the name of Dr. Ken Iverson. And IBM adopted him when they made him some senior fellow. And Ken Iverson came up with a syntax notation in the 1960s called APL. Have we ever heard of APL? Anybody ever programmed in APL? Then you can probably recognize my 1976 t-shirt, which I used to
way back then, <laughs> that uh, said APL is taking over. And, and for a bonus, what's that, what's that symbol in the middle called? Come on, if you really did APL, you know the symbol name. Square? No, it's not a square. Yeah, it is square, but. <laughs> Dude, you guys are like lame. Everybody raise your hand, shame on you. Pardon? It looks like a floppy. No, it's called a quote quad. That was for alphanumeric input. So you all failed, so you don't get the million dollars. <laughs> but what we found out is that as you work with the system, like any other system, no matter how large or how close it is, there's always a chance to explore on the boundaries. And so what we found out is that going through all the functions, and if you understand APL, it wasn't just that, but the entire keyboard was symbolic. So the up entire, there was no uppercase. Everything was uppercase to begin with. And then shift something gave you know, little Greek symbols, squiggles, squares, et cetera, things like that. And they all had some special functionality. Well, as we explored, as we learned, we started doing stuff. We figured, OK, you can just do this normal stuff playing with the computers. At the time, one of the guys found out that um, these little functions they used to call I-beams. An I-beam would give you all the system information. So you could find out what your user ID was with I-beam 21. You could find out right, it was I-beam 29. You could figure out system origin, your random number root, things like that. But then we got a copy of a piece of software that we found out of an old IBM programming manual. And it had something called a dyadic I-beam. That is an argument on the left side and the right side. But we'd never seen it before. And we started playing with it and realized, dude, this works. So we want to know more about how do I-beams work, because that seemed to be the system control, the way that you own the system. So a buddy of mine, Ray Clark, he was, uh, I guess he was a junior. I was a sophomore at the time. Decides to go to ride his bicycle down to IBM headquarters in Buffalo, New York, at least the local branch office, to try to get a copy of the license book, LY, if you ever had an IBM manual, began with L, license, you could never own it. OK, they'd take it back from you. That explained all the system functions. And so Ray goes in there, marches into this office, some 16-year-old kid, and says, a copy of this particular publication. And it's like asking for the holy grail. You know, like, well, we don't give this thing out. He says, well, I want to talk to Dr. Iverson, you know, the original author of this thing. Well, he's on a I need to talk to him. So he kept pushing and pushing. They finally got a hold of that. I've seen he's in Armonk, New York, at some high-level conference. It's like, there's some kid here. He wants to talk. He says, what the hell does he want? He says, he wants to copy this pub. Damn it, give him the book. <laughs> so he came back with the book. <laughs> and this is pretty cool, because with these I-beams, you could like, add accounts, add memory, add workspaces. You could do basically anything. Bounce users off the system. Send system messages that look like they were from the system operator. And that was like really cool. Except we lacked one thing. There was on, only one user ID in the system that started out with privilege. And once you got there, you could bootstrap into something else. But just like rooting a box, you first need a rootkit to get in there. But we didn't have rootkits back then. But we did have <laughs> And there was a field trip where our high school got to go ahead to the computer center that was run by the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, or BOCES. And we got a chance to go into this big computer room. Now think about it. What's your typical vision of an IBM 360? Actually, IBM 370, because we had the newest technology, 145. It sits in a room about this big. It's about a third of this size. Got guys walking around looking really geeky with these big, thick glasses, white lab coats, and 14 colored pens in their pocket. And that's what you needed to get in there. Physical security. Because the data didn't get out unless you look like, like that to get in. So we're wandering around, and we're looking at that. You know, here's the computer. Here's the tape drives. Here's the drum memory. I mean, there's old stuff in there, but hey, you know, old days. And oh, by the way, there's the console, sitting in the corner, unattended. The console. So what are we looking for? Log in. You know, think about this. These are selected typewriters. So everything you type doesn't go on a screen and scrolls off. It goes on a piece of paper and scrolls into a big fanful pile on the floor. So these are distracting operators. I come over here and say, going through the paper, and we find it. There's the login ID for the system operator. And all the login IDs were numeric. I'm thinking, OK, it's 3. 14, 15, 9. 3, 14, 15, 9. <laughs> Figuring out what this number is? 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9. And that was the root ID <laughs> for the system, as well as the login password. It's like, oh, oh, did you ever have an adrenaline rush? Like when you finally <laughs> got in there, you know? We got it, we got it, but we got to finish the field trip. OK, calm down, calm down. Yes, look, look, look excited about these little disks spinning around. Look, they like, couldn't wait to get back to try it out. So we finally get back to get back to school. It's like, okay, come on guys, we're in. Let's go. Three one four one five nine. Enter the password. Number in use. <sighs> Nuts. <laughs> it's locked out. You can't get in when someone else is in there because you can only log in once. So now we create what? A race condition. 
when you start up the system in the morning, you've got to beat the operator to logging in. But you have a double race condition. And what's that? You've got to get back out before the operator figures out that you're in. You don't even need to win a contest. He'll just give you a cool shirt. So the problem is you get detected, they're going to change the password, you're locked out. But if you get in and you can privilege the guy next to you and then log back out, you got it made. Well, it turned out that we could never really pass the race condition because the other guys were pretty fast. But one morning we did. We got in, we got it, and we owned the system for a little while. But it's a little bit like a dog chasing a Greyhound bus. You know, dogs chase cars and things like that. What happens when you catch one? You know, you got, you got the whole thing. Like, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? And then, oh, God, so I got to get to class. You know, I got to head off to social studies. Like, I don't want to go to social studies. I want to rule this box. I own the empire. And there weren't enough trucks. Well, you could like hand over the privilege login ID to because you know they'd end up screwing up and mucking up with it. So we had to eventually log out. So given that opportunity, we started to figure out, okay, how do we go ahead and extend this? Because as I mentioned, all the user IDs were what? Numeric. And the way they set it up is everybody had a high school district, which is a five numeric, five digit numeric code. And Amherst Central High School was 16504. And junior high was 16525. And Orchard Park was another and Hamburg was another number in Williamsville, and they all had these different sequences. But then afterwards, the last three digits were apparently random. And the, we had three numbers that were considered public IDs, 909, 061, and 901. I don't know why I still remember these things 30 some odd years later, so still some brain cells left. And so you know, that was like the public ID, that was like the guest login, and anybody could use those. And every now and then some dork would come in there and put a password on it, and we'd have to yank it back out again. But then everybody had their own private number if you were in the computer club, which is pretty cool. Well, I remember. Goodness for the late bus, because you know, you're supposed to, school ends at 320, you gotta be in the bus at 345. And of course, there was a 430 late bus, a 530 late bus, and a 6 o'clock late bus. And after that, you had to make it home. I'll tell you what, in Buffalo, we got two seasons, winter and the 4th of July. So <laughs> you're gonna be walking home in the snow <laughs> unless you get out of there on time. So there's a lot of run for the late bus. But occasionally, they let us in on a Saturday morning. All right? So now you understand why like, I didn't get married till later in life, because I was doing the geek thing. You know, right now, it's cool to be a hacker. You know, we wear or red. Oh, by the way, this is my socially responsible shirt for Project Red. <laughs> and if you like it, I printed up 24. I'm donating half the profits to the charity. They're right here. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to profit from it, but that's for them. If you want one, get one, because when they're gone, they're gone. But uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm you know, going on a Saturday morning, working on this system, and I'm playing around with a random number se sequence. Remember, because you've got a, do all system computers have random numbers? No, what do they have? Pseudo random. And what do they need? A C. Well, guess what? I'm poking around a little bit, and I do you know, 1,000 question mark, 1,000. You know, it was a sequence. Question mark was a random number in the sequence. And it starts spitting out numbers, and I go through it, and I look part way down, and I see 909, 61, 901. Remember those three numbers? They're all in the same line. What's going on? So I try logging in the next one, and it works. <laughs> and I try the next one, and it says number locked. Back then, we weren't smart enough because you had a good ID but a bad password to tell you a bad password. If you had a wrong ID, no matter what the password was, it like number doesn't exist. So it kind of helped you along a little bit. You know, major adrenaline rush when I said, okay, these seem to be like in blocks of 50, so let's grab another high school and let's try their sequence and pick those three. Oh my God, we got them all. We had every login ID in Western New York, and right about then, the computer teacher walked. Hey Mark, how you doing? <laughs> Pull that, you know, that paper counter like you're sitting out of there. Oh, we're doing fine. Um, nothing here, nothing to look at. Move along, move along. He told me later, he said, you look like you were dying or something like that. I was, you know, I practically wet my pants. It was like, I don't want to be caught with this stuff. You know, of course, the grand scheme of things, you look back like, so what? But well, hey, when you're 16 years old and there's no internet and you own every single school in the entire part of your state, that rocks. It's never enough. And I told you we used to have what? The acoustic coupler? Yep. Yeah. And so we actually had these little tie lines that we actually you dial five, and then you, you beep, push the button, hang up, and it connect. And chunk, 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 off you go. Well, if you dial nine, guess what you got? Beep, 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 busy. They disabled the outside line. If you dialed one or two or, five or four or six, nothing happened. But if you dialed eight, you got a really weird sounding dial tone. 
cool. Then you try to like dial home and it doesn't work. So you get a weird dial tone, but no number works. So what do you do? Yeah, start trying stuff, okay? <laughs> you brute force it. What do we got here? You want NSA swag or you want a t-shirt? Uh, NSA swag. NSA swag. <laughs> yeah, we gotta do some more contests in a minute. God, I got money hanging all over the place. You guys should be up here. So anyway, the, um, we, we try to go ahead and start brute forcing. So what do you do when you're ore dialing, right? So what's, where do you start when you're ore dialing? Start at one. One, one. Still nothing happens. One, 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 click. Ooh, it's a three-digit sequence beginning with one. That's why none of the phone numbers worked, because we all kept trying to dial real numbers, and they didn't work. But as soon as you went into that, and it turned out that that was a New York State tie line system, and the tie line connected all the major institutions in the state of New York to each other. So it's like, OK, this is cool. So then you dial, and you get a certain number, and then it connect you to another switchboard, and then nine to get out. And occasionally, you get a dial tone. And sometimes they were restricted to the local numbers, but occasionally, they would work for a long distance. <laughs> now, I found out, you know, I kind of alarmed my mom quite a bit, because you know, I was, we were a family of six. You know, six kids, and we don't do that anymore, you know, because it's economics, I guess, or something like that. But, so the last of us, you know, a good Catholic family, lots of kids. Which meant we never had any vacations. You know how much it would cost to put six kids on an airplane plus the two adults and things like that. So my first airplane ride was when I headed off to college. But my mom and dad were down in Florida on vacation for a couple of days. I don't forget who the babysitter was, but like turned gray and aged in no time at all, all these bad kids running around. So I said, let's try this out. So I call you know, 305, whatever it was. Because remember back then AT&T was 49 cents a minute and things like that, and that was the day, and you call on the weekends and it was cheaper and then at night. Hi, Mom, how you doing? What's wrong? Did the baby fall? No, no, the baby's fine. Mom, I'm in school. No, really, what's wrong? You know, someone's sick? Like, I'm just calling up to say hello. Like, you never picked up the phone and called long distance during the week because it cost a fortune. And like, then I had to call my mom, and like, hey, that was a bad idea. <laughs> so when you root something, don't share it with your family. Just mom doesn't get it. So for those of you who do have these cards, let's do another card drawing. If you smell them, seriously, that is the smell of mom's attic. These cards have been in mom's attic since the early 1970s, and I dug them out last month to bring them here. Okay, need a new number here. Number, oh, it's a latecomer, so I know this, per, no, it's, I'm sorry, it's an even number. 0095. 0095? All right. We'll draw another number, but you don't get the for the prize. I get to keep it. So anyway, we figured, all right, that didn't work, but we did find out that uh, there was another system, and somebody I was talking to last night was from P Poughkeepsie, New York. Is that you? No? But why are you not writing out your head? Like you, Orchard, Orchard Park. Park. Okay, you, you were in Orchard Park, but someone's in Poughkeepsie, it's, New York. Dallas Dragon, he's not here right now. Okay. Anyway, turned out that the main system called Seacoast was in Poughkeepsie, New York. Now, we were restricted in terms of the amount of memory space that we had access to, because when they were allocating memory to your system, you got it in terms of what are called workspaces. Now, a workspace had to hold all of your programs plus all of the RAM that you're actually going to be using, which really wasn't RAM back then, it was core memory. Now, how big of a workspace do you think you got to hold all of your programs plus to execute them in? 32K. 32,768 bytes. And so you could, you could do stuff. I mean, if you're in high school, what do you need more for? Because we like more stuff. <laughs> found out in Seacoast, they had like almost, they had virtual workspaces. They would grow as big as you wanted them to. And that was pretty neat. And all of a sudden, we realized that we could write these programs and run these programs that we could never do locally. But the hard part was, how do you get into the system? And I forget how. Somebody went over like University of Buffalo. I used to go up to UB, because they had a mainframe, an old CDC 6400, which is where these cards came from. And um, I used to work in the mainframe. And somewhere, someplace saw something posted about the ID, Maybe it was summer fair or whatever it was. But we found out there were four digit numbers, had really good security. And most of them ended at 00 and 01. Okay, really easy sequence to guess. But here's the problem. These are timeshare systems. When you log out, you get total connect time, total CPU time. And what does that mean? Billing. 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 Now, back then, there were no laws against hacking because no one knew about it. But there was the hacker ethic. Cause no damage. Don't take anything that doesn't belong to you. And we 
and truly believed in that because we didn't want to do anything that would hurt somebody and billing them for your time when you're screwing around your system would be wrong. But how do you hack the billing system when the billing system is external to your program? Remember that manual I told you about? <laughs> Go back in there. System accounting. System accounting is run up is that when the operator went to shut down, because this guy had to go home at night at 5 o'clock every day, so our system would usually shut down, and then you're off. And they bounce everybody off the system. If you're running, because it's, it's an online system, boom, you got bounced. Here's your accounting information. Go on, go catch the late bus. What we found out is that the system used to run their nightly backups just around 6 p.m., just at the same time as the last late bus. But the problem was they bounce you off, and then they run your accounting data. But they can only bounce you in an interactive session when it's their turn to talk. Because if you're talking, they're talking, you have to wait for that transition to occur. So we found out that with the system, which really had unlimited capacity, if you told it to type 200,000 zeros and hit enter <coughs> about a minute before six, it would take, what, 10 boxes of paper to print these things out. Well, you didn't have the paper, so we had these little type balls. We popped the type ball off so it wouldn't use up the paper. And this thing would start going. And you're looking at the bus and you look at your watch. You're like, shut it down the damn system, please. And all of a sudden it would stop midstream, which meant the operator had given up on booting us off the system. He just shut down, which meant all the accounting data got flushed. Nobody got billed for it. Turn off the terminal, turn off the light, run out the door, chase the bus down the front like you and then hopefully get home in time for another cold dinner because you've know, you got six kids, you're not going to stick around, no one's going to serve you a second meal. There's something left to eat it, if not. But those are the days of the early school hacking is you did whatever it took to figure stuff out. But you didn't damage anything. You didn't take anything. And that's what we've seen in the 70s, which is all intellectual exploration of the 80s where we started to get into some of the more maliciousness and some of the early stuff. In the 90s, just started becoming evil where we got the viruses and the attacks and the web page hacks. And now into the thousands, what are we seeing? We're seeing a shift toward financial gain. You don't see the web page hacks anymore. You're not seeing a whole lot of worms. Why? Because a lot of the hackers, the guys who are or crackers, correct me, CTs, I should know, are going for the bucks. And so we're seeing almost an urbanization of the internet. We're back when we were there, it was like a small town. If you left your front door open, it was OK. And if somebody walked in and they had to go to the bathroom or something, they'd, use it, they'd put the seat back down, and they'd close the door, and off they go. That's kind of the way we were. We put the seat down. <laughs> Digitally speaking, of course. <laughs> well, as it turned out, by the time senior year rolled around, we were all looking for summer jobs, right? We were all going off to college and, and things like that. So once a year, during the summer, they would hire one high school student from the entire western New York area, all 32 high schools, to work at BOCES headquarters to be the computer guy. And the year before, two years before, was Peter Gable, who went on to MIT. And then he founded um, one of the, he was an early founder of Lotus, made a ton of money from there. He got into developing a lot of LISP and artificial intelligence programs. I haven't seen Peter in years, but like he was the guy. It's a standard you had to meet, like MIT smart. Well, it turned out that all this stuff that I thought we're getting away with, phone calls, controlling the system, et cetera, they knew about it. <laughs> it just was they couldn't do anything about it because, well, what are you going to do? Like, you violated, well, well, your only crime is you're smarter than us. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, I remember talking to, to Mr. Berg, our computer club advisor, and things like that. And I was computer club president. Yeah, you can ima imagine that. And I said, well, like, I'd like to go do this job. It's like, well, actually, they want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> so. I go in for this job interview with Mr. Ritzenthaler, and that was the guy's name. And uh, I think he got mad at me because he always, you know, big kind of moon faced guy with red hair. And I remember taking a Ritz cracker and drawing some red hair on it. And said, you know, it's my Ritzenthaler cracker. But you know, the interview, and they basically said, well, you know, I got all this stuff. And I said, hey, here's what's going on. I'm, you know, we weren't doing it to be malicious. We didn't want to steal anything. We didn't take anything. We just wanted to explore. And oh, by the way, you know, I'm going off. You know, do computers, and I'd just as soon tighten everything up for you. So I got hired at the massive rate of $2.10 an hour to work full time for the state of New York. And back then, minimum wage was $2.30 an hour, but they could pay less of it because it was the government. And I also had a night manager job at the local grocery store in the convenient food mart working three nights a week. And that was $2.30 an hour, so that rocked. So I'd work 8 to 30, 
race home, grab like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something because they had to be at work at 5 and then work till midnight and then get up the next morning. So I worked a 63 hour work week. The take home pay was 98 bucks. And I was doing well because I remember my buddy Mark who was our high school valedictorian. Graduated number one out of 500 of us. He came by my grocery store one evening to put up a little sign that says, college freshman willing to do all kinds of yard work. You know? <laughs> so it was a tough time. This is Buffalo. This is early 70s. Bethlehem Steel shut down, Bell Aerospace shut down, Chevy plant shut down, Ford plant shut down. The city looked like a post-war economy when all the young males left because there was no work to be done. I used to come home for college, I come, even come home early, you know, first couple of years out of college. And I go to the bar with a buddy of mine, has two girls shooting pool, a couple of girls at the bar, girl over there at the jukebox, and I said, is this one of these like, <laughs> bars? He says, no, there's no man left. It's like target-rich environment if you're straight. <laughs> because everybody left town, which is also why real estate stayed cheap because you didn't have the two family incomes chasing off the money. And so while all the rest of the country back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, got started getting really expensive, Buffalo stayed dirt cheap. You can still buy a house for next to nothing. My brother bought his home four years ago for $10,000. For real, three bedroom house, built in 1900, <coughs> habitable. It was appraised at 27. The guy owed 17 on the mortgage and they'd offered him 10. And the bank said, well, these guys left town and it's not worth chasing somebody for the same. So they took the $10,000, they took the seven grand write down. So remember that, banks will write down a few thousand bucks just to let you in. My sister bought her first house, and she's, by the way, 18 years younger than I am. Uh, she bought her first house this past year, nice place, and it was uh, 86,000. Full up, beautiful home. It, you know, if, if, you ever, if you ever run in hard times, go to Buffalo. If you don't want any trouble in snow, you can live there dirt cheap. Except the taxes will, will kill you. So, you know, while we're doing all this, in uh, January of 1975, Popular Electronics had an interesting cover story. Anybody ever watched like the Discovery Channel or something like that? What was on the cover of that thing? Altair, Altair 8800. Somebody needs an NSA coin over here. Is that you? Better be. Otherwise, it's going to hit me right in the face. It was you. All right, pass it on. The Altair 8800. First 8 bit microprocessor thing you could buy. It had a Z80 chip in it. And it's like, this is cool. Well, because this computer network had linked all the high schools together, and because we sort of mastered the art of owning other high schools as well as communicating with them, we resurrected an old computer club. It's called the Student Cybernetic Laboratory Skill. And this really geeky guy named Harvey Elkabees from Williamsville was like the first president. Nobody liked him, so they voted him out, and I ended up being in charge of it. And we said, what's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to buy one of these suckers, and we're going to build it. It was about $350. Well, back then when $2.10 an hour was a good working wage, that's a lot of money. So we had to pool our resources. We all chipped in 20 bucks, 10 bucks, whatever we could. I had paper route back then, and you know, that's where our money came from. And we bought one. I was like, all right, this is cool. We're going to have our own computer. You open up the box, and guess what you get? A lot of parts. A board and a lot of parts. Resistors, diodes, capacitors. Only one chip, the Z80 <laughs> chip. That's it. No motherboard that you just plug stuff into, don't slap in any IO port. That's it. Plus the front cover, which is all LEDs and switches. All right, so let's get going. So this is a ton of stuff. So we got this, it's a lot of little boards and a lot of soldering. So we kind of meter out things. OK, Jack, you're going to work on this one this week. So you get 12 resistors and 10 diodes and this. And, and Jack takes them home and he starts working on and soldering. And you know, Kevin, I need you to go do that, so he goes work on a different part. So this takes us about a month and a half to two months. And of course, once you're done with your work, you pass it on to the next guy to look at it to make sure you don't have any cold solder joints, you didn't roast anything alive with all these components. And finally, we got all this stuff together. And we're over at Tom Richmond's house, because Tom was a senior. You know, being a senior was a big deal back then, I guess, and as well, I was a junior, and there were other people younger than that. And uh, we're ready to install the chip. So we're down in Tom's basement on the ping pong table. And we don't want to screw it up because there's like warning, static electric discharge can destroy this thing. Like, well, we don't want to lose this chip. So we take Tom and we take a metal wire, we tie it around his wrist, and we tie it to the, the sewer pipe in the basement. <laughs> so this guy is tethered so that any, you know, like, any possible amount of energy is sucked out of him. You can do like his life force draining into the sewers. Like, oh, it's melting. Hey, maybe I'll go in the, like, the, uh, 
best of, right? You have to do is follow the white firewall. Whoa! Stuff like that. Anyway, so Tom, <laughs> yeah, we watched the clips. So Tom gets a chip, takes this thing, ever so carefully lines it up with the hole, presses in there. We stand back and we turn it on. And it doesn't work. <laughs> I just had this like three lights are on and nothing, and it's oh no. There's like any of a thousand possible bad solder joints or anything else that could be wrong with this thing. So what are we going to do about it? So right then, little Billy Richmond comes bounding down the stairs. Now Billy's a little roly-poly kid was in junior high school and always a pain in everybody's butt. And Billy's like, hey, what are you kids doing down here? What are you guys doing? Oh man, look at that big thing in the middle. It's not pushed in. And he reaches it with his thumb to do this. <laughs> and about a simultaneous, everybody's like, no! <laughs> and that was it. The chip wasn't seated correctly. And he pushed it in and it worked great. <laughs> so, so yeah, he lived. <laughs> so we got this thing put together and I, you know, after we got playing with it, it kind of limited, it only had like 4K of memory. But we said, hey, we gotta do something more than just like program it in machine code. Because when you programmed it, the only interface was the switches on the front and the LEDs. So when you loaded the program, it was 1001010 load 0001. One zero one zero 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 one load. Take a long time to program, okay? So you got one of the guys who was a sophomore, and Jim Merritt, I believe, was his name, because he got the next year he won the Junior Achievement Award for the United States for the best invention. But Jim developed a I/O device. It was basically a touchtone keypad with LED display that we could program at Noctil, and now we could go zero one. Three seven seven one two, boom, 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 and then you get display, and you can get the readout that way, and that rocked. And the rest of us who were more software oriented, we went ahead and started writing a basic compiler for it. I wrote the long divide routines. Somebody else wrote some other stuff, and we built all this stuff together. Now think about it. It's 1975. You have in front of you the first 8-bit microprocessor-controlled computer that you can have for general use. You built a keyboard and a display unit and you built a basic compiler. You've got Apple in one hand and Microsoft in another. Because at the same time, Woz was working on his interface for the Apple One, and Bill Gates was doing Altar Basic. But they had something that we did not, and it's called vision. Because our vision was, let's take it to a school assembly and make it play music. And we did. Because <laughs> if you held an AM radio and you tuned the stations and you held it next to the CPU and you ran certain no op sequence and you go beep, 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 and you could play the Jeopardy song or something like that. And that was like the highest achievement we achieved. And I tell you that not because I'm bitter, <laughs> <laughs> but to tell you the importance of vision. Because if you don't have it, you know, Lao Tse said, without vision, the people perish. But it's quite true. If you don't have a vision of where you're going, you could stumble across the greatest opportunity in your life and not know what to do with it. <laughs> One of the things I tucked away to try to remember. Well, you know, after that, what happens? Well, now it's college, so life goes downhill from there. And I headed off to Northwestern University. First time on an airplane. Going to the Great West, you know, like Northwestern, all right, I can handle it. What's in Chicago, you know, outside of Chicago and Evanston? Evanston, home of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. All right, 80,000 people, not a single bar, not a single tavern, not a single liquor store, only school in the Big Ten, that's completely dry. Not a fun environment to get started. Some interesting frat opportunities. I, I was never a frat member, though. We used to have uh, the GDIs. You ever have those in your campus? Goddamn independence. They refused to go ahead and join a frat house. So, but the frat house, they go ahead and they'd have a beer bash and they go ahead and throw all the bottles on the front lawn of the WCTU and all these little blue hairs banging on the glass. Hey, go away! <laughs> but we didn't get a chance to play with that. But we only had a chance to play with the computer systems. It was pretty neat. Because there, of course, they got introduced to the mainframe, which is kind of like what I was riding my bicycle back and forth at the University of Buffalo, but now we actually could get like credit for and things like that. So you took courses like Fortran and Pascal and all those useful things, and they made you take courses like COBOL, which I didn't want to take, and I hated it, but I kind of like eked my way through the class just because I did the minimum, because I said, I'm never going to be a COBOL programmer. I don't ever want to say, do you want fries with that? <laughs> hey, wait a minute, think about it. After, nine, after Y2K, where all the COBOL programs go? Well, right back to Burger King, so. <laughs> and these punch cards, by the way, 
Time for another punch card. Number 0083. All right. Would you rather be hacking or would you rather have a t-shirt? Or would you rather have NSA swag? NSA swag. All right. Dog tag or coin? Or badge holder? Badge holder. All right. <laughs> Wait, this is a DISA one. How did this one get in here? All right, NSA, badge holder. Take your word for it. Oh, yeah, he gets it back. Awesome. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah, dedicated to us there. So anyway, what happens is that we're working Fortran, working Pascal, and I get a job working for the university, doing some work uh, for the computing center. It pays now five bucks an hour. All right, this rocks. We're making some serious cash here. That plus my board job, washing dishes in the dish room, is able to make ends meet. I had sold my soul for my college degree and took a, an ABC scholarship, but that's the only way I got to Northwestern. Otherwise, with six kids, and I found Dad's old tax return two years ago. I was poking around the basement. He made fourteen thousand six hundred dollars that year. And you know, I always thought you wore your cousin's hand-me-down clothes and you got like one bicycle and you always took vacations in the station wagon and never flew anywhere because you didn't know what you had or didn't know what you didn't have because you didn't have MTV or anything like that to let us know where we were missing with all the bling. So <laughs> I was like, this is pretty cool. I don't mind. Should get out there. And I'm one night and I'm working on the CD system and then, of course, I RTFM and I'm looking at stuff. Okay, I'm doing my Fortran and my Pascal programming. It says, hey, you know, these interpreters or these compilers are files, just like any other files on a system, but they're executable files. Imagine that. And it turns out that executable is just one of the bits you can set. You can also set a protection bit, whether you can control who can access it, who can run them, as you expect certain system tools and certain system files to be unexecutable by the average person. Learned in high school with those privileged operators. Well, as it turned out, there were no protections set on these. And I had forgotten about this until I ran into a buddy of mine about five years ago. I think at DEF CON who reminded me that I had done this. You know, it's just, you know, stuff that you do. So I said, what happens if you rename the Fortran compiler to the Pascal compiler file name when you rename the Pascal <laughs> compiler to the Fortran <laughs> compiler name? Because I'd already taken both classes, right? Well, guess what? Every semester they're taught again. And that evening was the night before a major project was due in the Fortran class and a major project was due in the Pascal class. And so all the guys who took their job deck, because we used to submit them these big deck of cards, and you put them in, in the card reader, you wait a couple minutes, and then you look over to the line printer, and one thing comes up, and you look at your ID in the top. And all the guys who are writing Fortran programs got what? Pascal compilers. And all the Pascal programs got Fortran compilers. Of course, everybody's freaking out because this stuff is due in the morning. And I had no idea what's going on because I'm using one of these newfangled things, the CRT monitor with the keyboard. Like, I figured, hey, this is the wave of the future, right? You know, PDP-8, PDP-11, no, I'm going to do so. So I figured, like, okay, I'm going to go home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had no idea that I had like, just launched World War III somewhere over in the Technological Institute. As I'm, literally, as I'm walking out the door, the assistant director of computing for Northwestern University slammed some door comes running down the hall, practically screaming, saying, my god, they got the Pascal compiler too! You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, I reminded him of that line in Top Gun, this is not good. <laughs> so I followed him back over to the main computer room, and of course you're never allowed in the Holy of Holies, but you just say, I, I, I come in through the door. I figured, hey, I'm a $5 an hour employee, right, this dude, I can get in here. And this guy's like panicking, talking to the system operator, like, excuse me, go away, kid, you bother me. And excuse me, he's like, no, we got problems to deal with this. Like, I know all about what? So I caused it. I was like, no, no, time out, time out. I said, I, here's what I did, here's what I did. It's like, you got to talk to the boss. I said, but first you got to fix it. It's like, sure, no problem. So, you know, like Beavis and Butthead, you know, here you go, toss it back, unscrew the systems, and the next morning I sat down with the director of computing. <clears throat> okay, Mark, let's talk. Well, what happened last night? Well, I was going through the manual and I saw that you didn't have protections, and so I was doing some testing. I set the testing, because ultimately what I ended up doing, I swapped them, but I swapped them back, now that I think about it, and then I locked them both out, because I thought they should have protections on them, but I didn't realize it locked out everybody from executing it, not just me. So, although I could still run them. And I explained it to him, and he realized that I was actually kind of doing it out of good faith, and he said, all right, well, you've actually pointed out some real problems, because everything was running wide open. You could do that back then. Why? Because it was still the 70s, the hacker ethic was still alive, and you didn't cause damage, you didn't take 
but it wasn't yours, you might have had some failed experiments. Okay, you know, do not add this plus this and stand close to it. <laughs> but, but we survived it. And so I thought that was pretty cool. By the way, yeah, the capacity of these things, how many bytes in one of these cards? 80. 80 bytes, right? And how many bytes in my little <coughs> memory card, which, by the way, like really rocks because it opens up into a USB drive. You plug it in. And I'm not giving this one away. But I am giving away like a one gig cruiser. One gig cruiser. I, I did a little bit of math work. That is 13.4 uh, million punch cards. <laughs> or if you look at the physical dimensions of them, it's approximately one semi-tractor trailer full. But because of the weight, you'd probably have to split it into two semi-loads. All right, let's give away a good one. Number 138. 138. Come on, this is good stuff. Not clear. I'm not doing clay. This is like hand grenades, OK? I get to keep the cruiser for now. But we'll do another one in a minute. But you don't get the buck. Reattacks don't get paid. Summer after junior year, it's like, OK, fine. I get a job. I'm going to stay in Chicago the whole summer. All right, looking for jobs, right? Well, spring quarter, because we're on quarters, not semesters, went ahead and got a job with uh, one of the banks in Chicago. I'll leave the name nameless for obvious reasons. And that was paid six fifty on that rock. I had a chance to do that, or for six bucks an hour, I could write all the graphic interfaces for one of the new systems that they had to go ahead and do three-dimensional graphics. I thought I could do that. I could do banking. Well, banking looked pretty cool. And oh, by the way, guess what program language this bank was using? The one I liked. The one I learned as a kid. It's like, all right, this rocks. I get paid to have fun. So what they had is they had what they called a bond evaluation system, or BESS. And what it did is this was a system that the bank and all their financial planners used to buy and sell hundreds of millions of dollars worth of bonds for the high value of investors. And this whole thing was this really sophisticated series of algorithms and programs and need access. And of course, everything is password protected and controlled. And here they get to the bank, and there's money involved while the security's turned on. I think it was like my second day on the job. Could have been my last day on the job. But, and I'm, again, testing. And I said, well, I want to get into that. And I says, oh, well, that's how they do this. Well, I needed some information, and everybody was at lunch. And I found out that, hey, if you just, well, did this, you could get the entire ID and password file, which I did. I printed it out. And I said, I shouldn't be able to do this. So I wrote a little note saying, hey, I found this and stuck it on my boss's desk. And I went out to lunch. <laughs> well, you can imagine what happens. Uh, the senior vice president would like to talk to you. <laughs> so got to sit down with the senior vice hey, Everybody's vice president of the bank, right? You know, vice president of janitorial services, but you know, the senior executive, grand poobah, you know, guys with gray hair and things like that. Then, you know, you're talking to some serious people. And I explained, I said, hey, you know, you've got some serious security problems here, and I just want to show my boss what it could do. I mean, if I were obviously or evil, I wouldn't share that. He said, we've been using this system for two and a half years, and no one's ever found this. I, I got 10 hours on the job. But that's what we do, right? We think that way. We think differently. So I said, well, I can build you a new security system. OK. Oh, by the way, the answer on what the job was, they were going from an online system, which is a timeshare system up in, I think it was in Canada, and transferring it to a local in-house, because they bought their own IBM 370. Wow, bank with some money. Imagine buying their own data center. And so, unfortunately, all those different variants of APL were slightly different. So this function had to change to that and that. And they hired four people, me one of them, and three others being permanent bank employees, to go through all the software libraries and make all these changes. Well, think about it. If I'm going to change all the quotes to single quotes to double quotes, I'm going to change this operator to that operator, how much intelligence does that take if it's the same thing every time? And they've been working on this thing for three or four months. I said, why don't you just write a routine that just substitutes everything. And they looked at me like at his third eye. It's like, what? Yeah, try it. What's the routine? What's, it, what's that? So anyway, I wrote it. And I tested it on a couple things. And I said, hey, guys, this will do basically one and a half man years worth that you budgeted for in one evening. <laughs> Thank goodness they weren't unionized, OK? It'd have been real trouble. You know, it's Chicago, remember? You know, someone come break my leg. Hey, you know, you're messing with our billing rates. <laughs> so ran the thing, and it worked. I mean, it, it worked beautifully. It worked so well that I basically worked my way out of that job. But that was pretty cool, because the bank says, we want to hire you full time. 
wow, this is great. And you know, you can almost like name your own place. There's only one problem. What happens by the time you're going into your senior year in your ROTC? <laughs> I've already signed my papers. I'm obligated. I'm going out to sea. I'm paying back for my college education, spending four years at a, out at sea. It's like, I'm not available. And it's like a draft pick. You know, you play basketball, but you're playing for the Naval Academy. Can you come back in four years and maybe you're still in good shape? I don't know. So I had to turn down the bank job and instead headed off and uh, headed over to the Philippines and then off to Okinawa and all kinds of other really cool places where I learned never play poker with the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> got taken. And of course, off you go into the military because I got you know, graduated, off into the Navy. And of course, everything there is the old tube computers, water cooled tube computers for the fire control radar for all the major systems. The only problem was I didn't get on one of those really cool ships. Because I know that going back and forth, remember, the only time I've ever been in California was like stopping over there on the way out to go to this Navy cruise overseas. And I'm like, well, San Francisco looks like a really cool place. Like a Silicon Valley there, which really wasn't Silicon yet because not much had happened. So you're farther up the elemented table. It's like Neon Valley. And then it's working its way down to Cobalt Valley and eventually Silicon Valley. <laughs> but I said I want a non-carrier combatant, you know, something with guns, out of San Francisco. Because you don't want me in a carrier because if you're a junior officer, you get lost. Well, it turned out there are no non-carrier combatants in San Francisco. There's carriers and there's non-combatants. Well, what's a non-combatant? Like a supply ship, an oiler, or whatever. So I was saying, congratulations, you've got orders to the USS Mars. <laughs> All right, I'm thinking, like, space program, involuntary, like, monkey push buttons. Off. No, no, it's just a ship. And it's actually, you know, the designator was AFS. You know, like, a, all these ships have letters, like carrier CV, destroyers DD, things like that. I had to look it up in Jane's fighting ships. I had no clue what an AFS was. It says, carries groceries and spare parts. Like, great, great, an attack food ship. <laughs> and so I got assigned to AFS. I spent my first two and a half years in the Navy on the number one attack food ship. And I had business cards printed up in the Philippines. I actually had two batches printed up. I remember my dad had this really cool card that I saved one. It was an old yellowed one that he had when he was younger. It was like, war is fought, governments run, uprisings quelled, revolution started, orgies organized, virgins converted, computers verified, you know, things like that. You know, stuff that you know, today you wouldn't want to hand out just because of political incorrectness. But I remember going into this little print shop there in Alongapo City, which is uh, usually what not most sailors do other things in Alongapo City. Uh, you know, here I am, still kind of good, strong computer geek genes in me, and I'm not interested in the delicacies of the <laughs> bars. And uh, I sit down with Mr. Del Rosario, who owns the place. And I said, uh, Mr. Del Rosario, I'd like to get a business card, please. And he said, OK. You know. And I, I'm getting ready to show him this card. He says, tell me what style you like. And he opens up the book, and there are six cards just like my dad's. You know, it's like, Dad, I never knew you were here. <laughs> so, but I had that one. I had another one printed up with a ship. And the you know, little graphic guy made a little plate. Labor was next to nothing back then. Got a whole set of uniforms made for like 10 bucks. But anyway, I got my business cards printed up, and it says, the number one attack food ship proudly presents G. Mark Hardy, Ensign, United States Navy. And of course, I put our ship's logo on the bottom, our motto. You can whip our potatoes, but you can't beat our meat. <laughs> and those got distributed all around the West Pacific. And if I could recall them all back, you know, it's like system recall. But you know, 25 years ago, what the heck, that was fun. Our computers were water-cooled, tube-based, not a whole lot of fun. So the last ship I was on, I went on to a, another ship. And it was pretty cool because a supply officer just came from the Naval Postgraduate School. And he got a master's degree in computer science. He says, all right, this is a brand new ship. It's in the shipyard. So you get a lot more latitude in what you can buy than once you're already out there at sea. So he installed this Alpha Microsystem, 32-bit processor. Well, we're going up a thing. And he networked the whole ship. We were the first microprocessor network ship in the Navy, possibly in all the navies, because of the guy. And you know, the interesting thing is in the military, especially in the Navy, if you're a supply officer, and if you make it all the way up to captain without going to jail, it's, it's really pretty cool. So um, anyway, we get underway, and off we go. And we have this thing, of course, you're all in a little shell, but it was always very easy to get out of the shell. So it's always kind of a thorn in their side trying to just prove them what the problem was. Well, one day, guys came by, and they said, uh, we're here to take your computer terminal. And say, like, they found out again, I guess. No, um, we got to go. Well, what? You got to talk to the Supply Corps officer about that. Well, what's going on? He's like, Jim, what's going on? They're taking my computer. He says, Mark, we'll talk about it later. He says, no, I want to talk about it now. What's going on? It's being repossessed. <laughs> he hadn't made the payments on it because you weren't allowed to pay for it once the ship was commissioned. So he just bought the initial system on an installment plan. And then once the ship got underway and we sailed from San Diego to Norfolk, he figured, OK, other coasts are never going to come get us, right? <laughs> 
That's uh, the supply system. He, didn't make he, oh, he did. He was already a captain. He made captain. But I don't think he made much, much farther than that. The guy who was on my first ship, though, the spy officer, he made two-star admiral. And, uh, and I caught up with him. He's now living in Norfolk, runs the USS Battleship Wisconsin Foundation. Pretty cool guy. And, and knows everybody. So there's actually some life after the military. In fact, I got out and I said, hey, I need a three-year plan. What am I going to do? I want to go work for NSA. I went and I interviewed with NSA. And they said, cool, you got a computer science degree, you got a mathematics degree, uh, you're going to, you know, this, this rocks. And they said, hey, we want you. The problem was is that uh, the Navy said, you go to work for NSA, kiss your career goodbye. Why? Well, no, it's not part of your career pattern. You're supposed to go back out to sea, like go do a ROTC unit or something like that. No, I want to do computer security. So the Navy does not need computer security experts. <laughs> <laughs> Come to find out later that the Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, hated the guts of the director of the National Security Agency, General Odom. He said, basically, if any of my officers go work for that SOB, I want you to blackball their careers. Well, I don't know. I'm going on there. You're like, well, if I go work for NSA, and then, um, in three years, I'm out of a job. I got to leave the Navy. So if I got to get out anyway, why not do an end run on the system and learn how to run my own business? So I wrote out a three-year plan. So within three years, I have my own business. And so I submitted my resignation. I said I'm going to go leave to pursue a career in computer security, 1984. And I went to work for Booz Allen Hamilton. There was Bruce. Yeah, good company. Learned how to be a good blue chip consultant. Spent a year and a half there. Went up to Connecticut, worked for a little startup company. And then two years, six months later, I started National Security Corporation which I still have today, it's my own little consulting business, I figured I'd hire people out of NSA. And from there, you could do all kinds of neat things like that. And uh, started the company, and first four months, I made 300 bucks. And it got pretty, it was getting pretty desperate. And you realize, is this gonna work? And then I realized, I got a job with a couple of buddies, and made 12 grand in two weeks. It's like, all right, this rocks. All right, I was actually able to build 1,500 a day, and I said, this is gonna be great. It was 12 more I'll ever build that kind of rate again. <laughs> but, it primed the pump, it proved to me that I could do my own thing. So if you're willing to go ahead and to execute a plan and take the risk, you can pull it off. And then since then I kind of joined mainstream and worked a lot of different things and uh, focused on computer security. But I was had a talk a couple weeks ago with Mark, Marcus Random. A lot of you know Marcus. And you know, Marcus, I say, is one guy who's made more people millionaires without making himself a millionaire. <laughs> He's a great guy. But in this panel we're talking about, I said, what do you want to do with your career? He said, basically, and, I, and this is for attribution, I'm going to attribute to him, but I wish I thought of it. If you want to do technology, do technology. If you want to manage and run businesses, manage and run businesses. If you try to do both, it's just like that little zebra lane on the highway where you're going to end up right in those big barrels and smack right into them. So if you love the technology, stay with it. Let other people worry about profit margins and making sure the payroll comes in and whether the marketing and all and stuff. If you want to do that stuff, that's very cool too, because then you create the job opportunities for the other people to focus on the technology and things like that. So I was talking with Chris Wasopel. Chris, you here? I guess at the bar last night. He's got a new company up and running. And it's a lot of folks who are taking their companies and making them happen. So I encourage you, if you get the opportunity, to go ahead and do that and just follow through with the determination, because you can make stuff happen if you want to. And we've got these marathons running out here. And I marathons and people you know come and look at me and says you can't be 50 years old I says well I think I'm aging well so far so good take care of yourself but tell you what running through marathons will test your determination because you want to quit not just there but all through the training but then you find out that if you're able to do these things you can actually do some real stuff in your life and I give you a quick recap of five things that I thought were important that you should do have a vision vision, you're just going to go ahead and accept what somebody else gives to you. And then have a plan. I wrote down in early 84 when I read some book about how to organize your life, what I wanted to do with my life. And I found that sheet of paper when I was preparing for this talk. And I wanted to start a computer security company. And I wanted to do consulting. I wanted to do public speaking. I wanted to do stuff. I put it in writing and there's magic in that. Do you have any written life goals that you've updated within the last 12 months? And if you show hands, my hand is not up right now. You will see probably percent okay do that a study was done at Princeton University back in the 50s looking at a number of people who had written goals for their lives and three percent of them had it they followed these people throughout their careers and at age 65 97 percent of the wealth was in the hands of these three percent at the age of 22 who had figured out the magic and going ahead and planning your life 
The third one is be willing to take the risk, take the jump. When I started my company, I said, what, you're going to cut the umbilical cord of a regular paycheck? You know what you find out? It's not that bad. Because you can always go back to work for somebody else. But I tell people, it's like hanging from the end of a rope in a totally dark room, and you can't see a thing. And someone says, let go of the rope and fall to the floor. It's like, got to be 50 feet, 100 feet. You might like, OK, let's do it. That's it? That's all it was? I mean, it's only, it's only been that far all along. It's only been that far away. You don't have to hire a factory. You don't have to hire 10,000 workers to go ahead and do your own thing. If you want to be a consultant, you need a box of business cards and a laptop. By the way, my first computer was $7,000 because it was a, a 386, 20 <laughs> megahertz. It had a, 8 megs of memory, and memory was $500 a meg. It was a $4,000 option to get 8 megs of memory. That's the gross national product of Canada right here in the hand <laughs> in 1988 prices. And I got 130 gigs, or 0 0.13 megabytes, to put it in today's parlance. 1,500 bucks without the controller. But it got me started. And I took the risk, and I went through the $300 for the first four months, and then made the money, and it, and the, it off and winning, and I started making stuff. So be willing to take a risk. And stay focused. Pick what you want to do and stay with it. Don't wander around. I'm, I'm a victim of that. Yeah, I want to run things. And I want to do the security stuff. I want, to, I want to do security and manage stuff. I want to do fit. If you stay focused, that's the magic to making your plan work. Because you've only got so much time, you've only got so much life. And eventually, no matter how old or how young you think you are, we all have a time to live. And that TTL is ticking down every day. And you don't know when it gets to zero till it gets there. So live every day like it's your last, and someday you'll be right. <laughs> and then lastly, stay there with some determination. Absolutely stick with it. You are going to encounter opposition. You're going to encounter people with no idea. That's stupid. You can't do that. Nobody's ever done that. Ignore them. They're afraid to try themselves. Don't seek the counsel of the timid. Don't seek the counsel of the weak. There are people who don't want to see you succeed because then they would have to admit to themselves that they can't do what you can do. I have never seen a group of people in my years that have a higher IQ, higher intelligence than the computer security community. At the same time, when I go to a place like DEF CON, I have never seen such a mismatch between IQ and financial well-being. There are some absolutely destitute, brilliant people out there in our line of work. And there's, there's a fundamental disconnect there, because I know that the internet is fun. I know the computer systems are really cool. But it's like a dream world. Anybody ever have a dream about finding money? Anybody ever wake up with it in your hand? Internet's the same way. If you come and they hack systems all day or all week or all month, I don't care what you own, whether you own the high school network, Western New York, or you own the whole in internet. That's still dream world. This is reality. Carbon base is what we are, not silicon based. And a lot of times we confuse that reality. So live your life. Learn how to love, learn how to care for people. Make a difference out there. Because at the end of the day, that's what's really going to be important. Your old computers are not going to sit around with you when you're 80 years old and want to listen to your stories. They're not going to want to take care of you, but your family will. And every now and then, sometimes you find out that a family member just kind of thinks what you're doing is cool. I guess I'm not going to embarrass him if he's hiding, but he's hiding. OK, my son's over there. Yes. He likes my friends. He likes what I do. Hates my music, you know, hates all this stuff. But <laughs> won't wear his hair this way, but that's okay. That's cool. A Z80 processor. So you were north of the border, eh? <laughs> Over the pond. Okay. I will answer that after the break, because I'm, I'm out of time, but I want to do a couple more draws real quick, But I, if you want to stick around. Anyway, OK, quickly, 138. All right, good. Ob object reuse policy, not in effect. 145. One gig, Sandisk. 145. 145. All right, I, hey, this, this is as random as I could think of, OK? 101. 
You want zeros? Okay, zero, one, zero, one. Okay, it's binary. Somebody would say, I got five. Is that because it's binary? All right, I'll go to the five dollar bills, but you don't get to keep the money. Zero, zero, one, nine. You got a real one? Okay. Here's a one gig. You can have NSA stuff instead. <laughs> yeah, you can buy that Best Buy all day long. You can't get this stuff every place. All right, a couple other more. 137. They're not up yet. Okay, uh, 0015. Those are the ones they handed out early. They're not here either. See, it doesn't matter what times. Sleep is for the week, okay? You got to stick around. Okay, 0132. 0049. Jackpot, right? You got a winner back there? Okay. NSA swag or one gig? Okay, you got it. Come up here and get it. Not enough time to explain. Do you have a problem making decisions? Well, yes and no. <laughs> 0068. All right, run out of time, so like two more, and then after that, I just like come talk to me. 0149. Got a real one? Yeah. One gig? Oh. All right, NSA stuff. <laughs> yeah, people know I got, I got dog tags, I got cards, and I got the little badge, badge holders. <laughs> Seeing a pattern. <laughs> and uh, last one, because these are the ones I got out of the ATM, so they're all ones. So only pick one of them, uh, zero, one, two, nine. All right, thank you very much. If you like a Haxer shirt, I've given half the profits to the Foundation Red Cherry. 20 bucks, I'll get 10. Thank you. Okay. I, you never have my I have uh, extra large and large, and I have red and black. Uh, extra large red. Yeah. Extra large red. Um, That's yours. Um, but oh. Large red, please. Large red. So. 20 bucks. 20 bucks? Can I get a NSA? Uh,